everybody. Um, we are recording this, um, and uh, and hopefully uh, you are all fine with that because we will be able to uh, share it on our Alaska Tribal Resilience Learning Network um, uh, later today or or by tomorrow, definitely. But we're happy you're here with us today. We are here for our presentation, our, our um, webinar titled Arctic Governance, Indigenous People and Wildfire. And I'm actually really looking forward to this uh, presentation with Ed Alexander today. Um, and it looks like we just have a range of uh, great people on. Um, many of you who are working at various scales from the local level to you know the regional and statewide and Arctic level. So um, just welcome all of you to um, our webinar. And um, of course, um, we as a team at the Alaska Tribal Resilience uh, Learning Network are coming to you from various uh, traditional homelands. Next slide. Um, Many of us work on um, the Trothyitha campus that's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks at the International Arctic Research Center. But we also have folks, um, our tribal liaisons in um, Klinkit Ani, uh, Southeast Alaska traditional territories, as well as uh, Denaina traditional homelands down in South Central. And then we also have um, one of our tribal liaisons out in uh, the Yupik Nation territory um, in Quinnahawk. So we're coming to you from many areas of our beautiful state. And so you're welcome to uh, put introductions in the um, chat. And um, we will go ahead and move into our um, inter introductions a little bit about the Alaska Tribal Resilience Learning Network. Um, excuse me, I forgot this slide here. Um, but our learning network is, of course, a resource for um, tribes and uh, tribal organizations that are really addressing, you know, the impacts of climate. Um, we are part of the Alaska Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is a, a federal partnership under the um, the federal government with uh, USGS and the University of Alaska, um, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, and so what that federal partnership does is really try to make uh, climate science available. And of course, under the federal government, uh, USGS has a trust responsibility to Alaska tribes. And through the um, Climate Science Center, we are, we are building out the Tribal Resilience Learning Network to support tribes, and we do that through, you know, one-on-one -on -one check in calls or te technical assistance, the e-bulletin many of you probably receive. We have um, monthly calls and then, of course, information sessions and training. So this is part of our information session um, series. So next slide. So of course we're here today to um, listen to Ed Alexander, who is going to really um, share with us some of the uh, long-standing work that he's been doing under um, the Gwich'in Council mm -hmm. International uh, GCI, and um, and I'm really uh, happy to have Ed in his role. Um, both at that level, at the Arctic level. Um, he's also done significant work at multiple levels um, across um, across indigenous world and whether it's locally um, in Fort Yukon, you know, and or, or at the um, Gwich'in nation level. Um, he's also worked extensively um, for I think more than 10 years at Tandana Chiefs. Uh, conference. He ran um, the education um, department there. He's also um, an educator, a longtime educator, uh, 17 years plus as a certified educator, working both as a teacher and a principal, so very much invested in our young people and our, our educational institutions. And then, of course, um, is very, um, very knowledgeable of uh, a lot of the policy and uh, uh, political um, 
the political scene that we deal with as indigenous people, both at a statewide and national level, but in particular um, right now, he's bringing that strength um, through his work at the international level. So he's going to talk about the Arctic Council, um, give us a broad overview of the Arctic Council, as well as the role of the permanent participants. And then um, briefly, you know, um, talk a little bit about the structure of the Arctic Council, which I think is really significant for all of us to hear about. And then um, expand on one of the initiatives that um, Guchin Council International and, and as well as the permanent participants are really forwarding, and that's um, you know wildfire um, at the uh, Arctic level, and how do we do? Um, how do we look at coordination? So um, I'm really happy to have him uh, talk today, um, and I think it's just you know very timely thinking about the national climate. Um, assessment that just came out yesterday um, that all of you, I'm sure, are going to be uh, perusing or um, either or getting introduced to over the next um, couple of months. And, um, and you know, that's a great resource. But in there, it has new chapters, um, in particular, in addition to the Alaska and the um, Indigenous Peoples chapter, which have new key messages, it also um, talks about, you know, the compounding effects. And we know with like wildfire and, and the issues around governance and making decisions and capacity building um, that, you know, we're dealing with compounding impacts um, at, at multiple levels at the Arctic. So with that, I will turn it over to Ed and he will uh, give his own introduction and then um, jump right in. So um, welcome, Ed. Uh, very excited to be with you all here today. Thank you for, for coming. Um, appreciate that lovely introduction. Uh, Council International and uh, to Gwalthin. Um, and so I, I work for Gwichin Council International uh, as the co-chair and head of delegation. Um, and I have a presentation for you all today, uh, obviously, and um, I'm just pleased to be able to share it with you all. And so we'll just jump right into it. Give me a second while I uh, figure out uh, my, my technical stuff here. And maybe I'll just remind yeah. you folks to um, try to place yourself on mute. We might have a few, few that um, need to be muted. So thank you. Go ahead, Ed. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the title for our talk today is Arctic Governance, Indigenous Peoples and, and Wildland Fire. And so, um, you know, Arctic governance uh, includes a lot of things. It includes uh, subnational uh, bodies like the state of Alaska, it includes states, it includes indigenous peoples. Um, and so, uh, and it can include a wide variety of, um, of different stakeholders. And so, um, it, you know, it's really important for us to, to be inclusive in Arctic governance and to, uh, to include uh, particularly the the viewpoints I feel of indigenous peoples across the north uh, as as the prime stakeholders in the region uh, as this is our historic homelands. Um, Butchin Council International has had a number of fires on on wildland fire and so we're going to be talking about some of those today primarily um, but I would also add that Butchin Council International does a lot of other uh, work uh, whether that's bilaterally with the United States or Canada uh, or other states around the world, um, you know, on cross-border mobility issues, on health issues, on, on mental health use issues of young people, or on renewable energy uh, projects like the Arctic Renewable Energy Network Academy. Um, we have some great videos out there. On, um, really encourage everybody to take a look at those or at some of our other uh, videos. You can find those in. Uh, uh, through our Facebook page or through our Twitter account or uh, on our web page or through the Arctic Council main page. And so I did want to um, kind of offer some broader context about our work that it doesn't just include wildland fire. <clears throat> so Gwich'in Council International is basically the foreign service arm of the Gwich'in Nation. 
And so we represent uh, all of the uh, tribal members and, and uh, all of the governments of the Gwich'in people uh, in Alaska, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territory on uh, international matters, primarily at the Arctic Council. Um, we have uh, three membership governments that uh, define our board and, and the actions that we take. And so our uh, member governments are listed here at the top of this slide. Uh, the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments, which has all of the Gwich'in uh, communities in Alaska as members. Uh, the Vantat Gwich'in Government, which is our uh, only uh, Gwich'in government in uh, the Yukon Territory. Um, the Yukon Territory also takes its name from a Gwich'in word. Um, and then on the far right there, we have the emblem of the Gwich'in Tribal Council, which represents all Gwich'in in uh, the Northwest Territories. And uh, we have an eight-member board, four appointed from Alaska, uh, four appointed from uh, Canada. Um, the four appointed in Alaska are appointed by our chiefs uh, through CATG. We have two appointed by Vantai Gwich'in Tribal Government, our First Nation government, and then two appointed by uh, Gwich'in uh, Tribal Council. We have one uh, employee. Our executive director uh, is Devlin Fernandez, and she's based in Yellowknife and uh, the Northwest Territories. So this is a, a map of a language map. It's not a political map. And so it doesn't have uh, strict uh, boundaries and so forth, but it gives you an idea about where Gwich'in are. Um, in uh, Northeast Alaska, uh, the Yukon Territory in the central uh, part of this image, and then uh, in the Northwest Territories. This language map shows that our language uh, is closely related to Hun, Hun Gwich'in. Uh, you can tell by the colors in this language map uh, which languages are closely related. Uh, because this is an Alaskan uh, native language map, it doesn't show the relationship of um, uh, languages in Canada, but Gwich'in is also very closely related to Northern Toshone and uh, Southern Toshone, uh, and quite closely related to Tana Cross and uh, Upper, Tana, Upper Tana as well. So uh, Gwich'in Council International uh, primarily works at the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is uh, a longstanding uh, entity that helps govern the North. Uh, it's the preeminent intergovernmental forum for the Arctic. Um, it arose out of the Arctic Environmental Protection Agency um, and through the Ottawa Declaration. And uh, it has uh, its real deep roots in the Cold War uh, in uh, kind of the uh, outreach from uh, Mikhail Gorbachev to um, the United States and to other Arctic states. And, and it's become uh, this leading intergovernmental forum. And when we think about the Arctic Council, um, it's inclusive of the Arctic states who all have a seat at the table, um, but it's also inclusive of all of the indigenous peoples of the North. And so it becomes uh, a very interesting uh, forum because it's the only forum of its kind in the world where uh, indigenous people sit at an equal table um, with uh, states. And uh, because the body is run by consensus, it's a long standing tradition, uh, even though we're not voting members per se, um, it's a long standing tradition that if uh, any permanent participants have an objection with, with um, any activity of the Arctic Council, uh, one or more states would also um, adopt that objection and, until it's resolved. Um, this model of consensus, of being inclusive, of discussing things until we move forward as a group uh, is very beneficial and it, and it favors uh, what's in uh, very much because it um, reflects our, our traditional governance uh, uh, habits. And so, when we think about our communities, um, I served as a second chief of my community for quite a number of years. And then during that time, uh, we didn't have a majority and minority vote. We worked th through our issues by consensus. And so discussing things until we all came to agreement. And so when we think about the protection of minority members, um, we have to think about the inclusion of those members, whether it's one state in the Arctic or it's a permanent participant, uh, an indigenous persons, uh, people's group. And so uh, that governance structure is very important to note. And it's also important to note that hard security is not a uh, issue that the Arctic Council deals with. 
and so that there is no uh, um, reason to exclude indigenous peoples from from uh, potential military discussions. And so that's a really important point about the Arctic Council too. So again, the Arctic Council consists of these Arctic states uh, listed, US, Canada, Russia, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, Kingdom of Denmark, and Finland. Uh, some folks might think, oh, well, why is Denmark in the Arctic Council? They're, uh, um, you know, they're to the south, they're on the, you know, European continent. Um, the Kingdom of Denmark is also, uh, you know, uh, Greenland is also part of the Kingdom of Denmark. And so, um, you know, they play a substantial role in uh, the Arct Arctic Council affairs as well. And then there are the permanent participants. And so this is a unique class in international governance, um, but it shouldn't be so unique. Um, one of the things that we always try to encourage is uh, permanent participant status or some other type of status like this and other uh, intergovernmental fora around the world. And so um, we represent Wichita Council International. We're one of the six permanent participants of the Arctic Council, along with the uh, Inuit Circumpolar uh, Conference, the Sami Council, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, and Arctic Athabascan Council and Aleut International Association. And so you can see our flags listed right there next to the uh, state flags. And that's uh, a family photo, I believe. I think we took that in, uh, it must be Robin Yemi because uh, I think that's Mike Pompeo in there. Um, and so uh, this is uh, a graphic showing the Arctic Council um, uh, kind of organizational structure. And so you have the eight member states, the six permanent participant organizations, and then we have six working groups who conduct the affairs of the Arctic Council. Um, and whether that's CAF, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, or the Emergency uh, Prevention and Preparedness Working Group uh, and Response Working Group, um, or the Sustainable Development Working Group, or Arctic Contaminant Action Working Group, and uh, AMAP. Uh, there gets to be quite a bit of a little bit of an acronym soup in there, but um, the important thing is that there are these working groups. And again, we participate in these working groups. Uh, these two are listed because I happen to be the head of delegation for Britain Council International for these two working groups. And then we also have um, Sustainable Development Working Group that we uh, sit at, and Devlin Fernandez is our head of delegation for Sustainable Development Working Group. Um, and so we try to participate in those working groups that our chiefs want us to participate in and have the most impact for our people. These working groups do a wide range of projects. They, you know, there could be um, uh, hundreds of projects and some of uh, the working groups as combined total. Um, and so there's a lot of work that happens uh, on the international level. A lot of things get uh, uh, brought up to um, the senior Arctic officials table, which is basically represented by this graphic. Um, so Gwich'in have been active in uh, wildland fire for a long time, not just uh, recently with the Arctic Council work. Uh, Gwich'in have always used cultural burning uh, around lake edges and uh, meadows to, um, you know, to remove uh, travel impediments, um, to increase um, the biodiversity in the land so that not just grass comes back, but that we have um, a wide variety of flowers and other kinds of uh, plant matter that can come back. Those plants are then also uh, more um, nutrient rich. They've basically been fertilized by fires in the springtime. We do it during um, a very specific time period. So it protects the landscape and creates um, barriers to having uh, rapidly moving fires in the summertime. So we burn during the spring when there's still snow in the woods, um, but the meadows have been uh, cleared of of snow, and so you can you can burn safely during that time, and it protects root structures of plants, and it's really a pretty beneficial practice. Um, you know, obviously that's like our historical practices, um, and it increase, increases carrying capacity of the land, increasing nutrition for the animals that are around. Um, it's a big practice around uh, muskrat uh, uh, camps and uh, families that uh, go out ratting, and then. Uh, it's also part of our uh, resource management now. And we have contemporary wildland fire crews that fit into the incident command system structure of the United States and uh, you know, in Canada. 
And so it's part of our sovereignty, which and have uh, uh, wildland fire crews. It's part of our, our response and uh, caretaking of our own lands. And so it's a reflection of those values as well uh, that we, um, we take care of our land and we're in charge of our land. And this is one aspect of our governance as Quichon Council International. Another aspect is having our own uh, wildland fire crews. But fires are changing. So, um, you know, we've seen uh, this big change in wildland fire, uh, changes in fire uh, weather. We've seen changes in uh, the number of people are being evacuated from northern communities, whether that's Fort McMurray or uh, Yellowknife this summer or Old Crow, uh, you know, in the Northwest Territories, uh, which is also between homeland. 70% uh, of the people of the Northwest Territory had to evacuate this summer. Uh, the community of Old Crow, our only Gwich'in community in the Yukon Territory, evacuated the summer. So we're seeing this widespread um, uh, devastation occur. And we've seen the nature of fire itself change. And so we've seen things like pyrocumulonimbus clouds occurring in the Arctic. Normally, you know, 30 years ago, you know, people thought that those structures were only um, uh, related to uh, volcanic eruptions, right? And so uh, that shows the kinds of intensity change in wildland fire in the Arctic that these types of um, weather phenomena are now occurring in, in Arctic areas. And so this is a map showing uh, the border of the Yukon Platts National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is part of Gwich'in country in Alaska. It's not the whole thing. Uh, obviously, the Vini Tai Reservation is not included here, um, nor is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to the north. But the area listed here, you can see um, the widespread fire damage in the in the Yukon Flats, basically during my lifetime, and um, and so over sixty five percent of the area has now burned. Um, and you think about um, this area uh, having multiple burns, and so some of the landscape actually changing from spruce forests to deciduous forests, or changing to grassland. Uh, because some of the areas obviously have multiple burn scars on them. Uh, and it's not just a fire map. It's also a map showing the effect of fire on our economy. It's showing the effect of the fire on the animals, which our chiefs have very explicitly talked about, uh, concern for uh, animal uh, well-being, uh, for plant well-being, uh, and so that we uh, have a better understanding of how these things are impacting uh, all of the animals that... Uh, we live in relationship to and are dependent on. And so uh, it's very important for us to uh, send out this message. This this area here, this Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge is equal in size to the state of Maryland. The area that's burned is equal to uh, four Delawares to give people context of, of how big this is. Obviously this is not a map that shows the impact to wildland fire to the whole Gwich'in nation. Um, that, that would also uh, be much larger, right? the total amount of burned area during this time period um, would be much larger. And so we have to think about uh, wildland fire uh, in the Arctic uh, through the environment too that it's in um, and how this environment is different than other environments. Why is this an issue? The boreal forest is the largest forest on earth and it contains as much greenhouse gas as the atmosphere uh, collectively for the entire planet. And we think about this forest uh, changing and burning and uh, maybe even converting to grasslands over large areas. Um, and we start thinking about, well, the transition of this forest not storing the same amount of carbon that it's releasing. And so it's becoming a net driver of climate change uh, across the world. And uh, the amount of carbon that it has is, is very alarming, right, and compared to the planet as a whole. And so it's been the largest uh, terrestrial carbon sink on the planet. Uh, it, it is served that purpose uh, you know, throughout human history, but uh, lately that hasn't been the case. And so we've started to see this change and particularly of threat and note in Alaska is Yetima, um, which contains a vast, vast store of greenhouse gases. And it's concentrated in a very small area from my perspective in an area about the size of Spain. And it's all within the Yukon Territory, Alaska, and um, the far east of Russia and Siberia and Yakutia. So 
Um, it's a very concentrated greenhouse uh, gas uh, uh, sequestration right now with Yetima. Um, and it also happens to be the most fragile of all permafrost. And so uh, wildland fire burning off this insulative layer on the surface, all the duff layer and the trees and so forth can leave Yetima exposed to rapid uh, melt. And so we think about the destabilization of this Yetima, uh, and this is a map of the world's supply of Yetima. Um, and if we think about this area um, uh, rapidly changing uh, over large landscapes, like we've just seen with Yukon Flats, it can become very alarming. And it's very alarming for our chiefs who recently passed a resolution uh, requesting tribal consultation with the United States on the issue of uh, wildland fire management vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Yetima. And so um, this is something that our chiefs and communities are concerned about, and they want uh, the world to be concerned about it too. And so uh, wildland fires respect uh, territorial integrity. Um, and so they burn from Alaska to Canada. The smoke from Russia goes across the world. Um, and, you know, we need to be more inclusive. We need to be more inclusive of all of the perspectives at the table. Uh, so that we can get the best answers um, and the correct answers for the crisis that we're in. And so um, we need to have coordination of response exercises. We need to have coordination of indigenous knowledge. We need to have coordination and cooperation on so many different things. And so Wichita Council International introduced two projects at the Arctic Council. And um, the first is Arctic Fire at the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna. Basically, that project seeks to... Um, uh, work with scientists and fire ecologists, indigenous peoples to better understand wildland fire uh, in an Arctic context. And the other is Circumpolar Fire at the Emergency Pre Prevention, Preparedness and Response Working Group. And that's to uh, evaluate legal agreements between uh, nation states on combating wildland fire and try to better understand um, how we can have improved legal agreements between the states, uh, improved coordinated responses between the states, having operational folks talk with our scientists to get a better uh, framework for uh, collaboration. And so um, these two projects are, are active and uh, now they're moving forward now that we're out of the pause stage of the Arctic Council. And I saw emails even today on, on both of these uh, projects from uh, member states and from uh, permanent participants and so forth. So the discussion's ongoing and, and continuing even as we, we talk here. And so we have to have um, international cooperation and collaboration because um, these issues are too large. Um, you know, 500 gigatons of uh, greenhouse gas and Yetima is too large of an issue for the United States alone to tackle. It's too large of an issue for Canada to tackle or Iceland or our Gwich'in. And so we need to have uh, international partners. We need to have uh, diplomacy. We need to have better coordination about uh, research. We need to advocate for more funding. Um, and so uh, that the world is aware that these, these issues are out there and, and they're a threat and they need to be uh, rationally dealt with. And so uh, the Arctic Council um, right now just an, an announced the chairship initiative on wildland fire because of the scope and scale of the, of the issue and, and the threat. And so Norway uh, through uh, the chair of the Arctic Council, Morton Hoagland, um, announced this initiative last month uh, with myself uh, in Iceland um, at the Arctic Circle Assembly to increase the profile of wildland fire in the Arctic, to increase um, the innovation that, that's necessary to deal with this issue, and to uh, generally raise the profile of what's occurring. And, and some folks on the east coast of Alaska, or east coast of the United States, um, felt that this the summer was wild, you know, with smoke. Some folks in Canada have felt it through the widespread burning of their lands, the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of people in Canada this year. Um, and then other states have felt it too. You know, Iceland's had uh, wildland fire experiences. Um, Russia's had, uh, you know, tens of millions of acres burn annually. And so we've seen some really uh, widespread uh, fire activity and this chairship initiative aims to find a place where uh, all of us as uh, states and, and permanent participants, indigenous peoples, governance, governments can uh, work together on, on this important topic. 
And so I wanted to share this quick video with you all. It's just a few minutes about the Chairship Initiative, kind of talking about um, the issue as a whole. So it's a little video on uh, wildland fire, uh, introducing the uh, Norwegian Chairship Wildland Fires Initiative. Um, and again, of course, you know, video is fine, but it's uh, just a starting point because it's necessary for all of us to share work and knowledge on wildland fire. And that's at every every space, right? So not just on the international level or at the Arctic Council or something like that. But this is on the local level. Um, you know, if are people being firewise in your neighborhood? Are you being firewise? Is your community have a regional plan for evacuation uh, in the north? Um, does your tribe have um, a wildland fire management plan? Do do you have uh, fire crews? Do what is the status of of wildland fire in your community? And so, it's really important for for all of us to uh, engage. Um, it whatever uh, level that we're at and to facilitate uh, those uh, connections, uh, cooperation, collaboration. And so uh, here's some more examples of some more international cooperation on fire in the Arctic. And here's a list uh, that you guys can go through, um, you know, on your on your own and stuff. Um, and a lot of great projects here. This is by no means an exhaustive list. There are more projects coming out every day around wildland fire in the Arctic. Um, very proud of um, all of the people who are working uh, in fire ecologists, operational folks, people with Alaska Fire Service, U.S. Forest Service, uh, Canada's interagency, you know, uh, on into Sweden, Norway, around the globe. Um, there's a lot of people putting in a lot of work 
on, on wildland fire, whether it's mapping through AMAP and, and my friend uh, Rolf Rodven's doing, uh, or uh, Jessica McCarty, or, um, you know, there's just so many people who've contributed a lot through different projects. Mike Young, Troy Buffard, uh, Colonel Soto have all uh, helped Gwich'in Council International advance these initiatives uh, and advance uh, international cooperation. And there's so many people working out there and just very appreciative of everyone doing, doing their part. And so uh, we need to change, right? Um, we need to change our operations. We need to change our viewpoints on the ecology. We need to have a better understanding of it. And we need to have a ground truth to, to the folks who are working on the ground. And uh, we need to have everybody sharing their expertise at whatever level that they're engaged in. And so that's really important. And so, you know, the discussion here really becomes um, how do you engage with wildland fire in the Arctic, right? This is certainly not um, uh, an issue for Charlotte Greenland, my co-chair for Gwich'in Council International and, and myself. It's certainly not an issue just for, for us or for the Gwich'in Council International Board um, or for Gwich'in uh, or for the Arctic Council. Um, it's, it's a personal engagement that people need to understand um, you know, more thoroughly before a uh, wildland fire knocks on your door like it did uh, the communities in, in Northwest Territories this this summer. Uh, we need these things to become incidents that we manage, not emergencies that we're responding to. And so that only in ha only happens uh, with engagement, right? And so we have to have uh, a real uh, thorough understanding of that. And so we need more research. We need to be more inclusive of indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, and we need to understand uh, the practices behind uh, cultural burns, and um, it's a shared global responsibility. It's not just um, it's not just one entity. It's not just um, one group or th through sci one scientist uh, or one uh, one agency that's going to solve this thing. Um, it's something that we have to collaborate and cooperate and work on together. And so, I really encourage everyone here, all of the participants who have come here, many of you are engaged in science, many of you are students, many of you are policymakers, um, and you know, really uh, examine how uh, you're, you're engaged in uh, wildland fire, whether that's through the health lens or through uh, governance policy, any other lens, right? Because we need to have much more engagement on the issue of uh, the climate crisis the wildland fire coming to the Arctic, you know. Um, I've always uh, talked about wildland fire in a bit of a storytelling kind of manner to try to get people to think about things differently. Um, you know, there's, the people always say there's only two stories in the world, a stranger comes to town um, or um, the hero goes on a, a journey, right? And so um, in this case, the stranger coming to town is, uh, the pyrocene, you know, this age of burning that we've entered, coming to the Arctic, coming to this this place that should not be burning. Uh, and the journey that we take is one that we take together on, on our response and what we do collectively will uh, uh, help determine uh, what happens with um, all, of, all of these issues, whether it's food security across the world or uh, how we address the global climate crisis. And so with that, I just want to say Masi uh, Chol to every one of you for, for coming and listening to the talk today and for uh, participating either as wildland firefighters yourself, uh, like all, all of these uh, gentlemen here uh, and, and ladies who are working the fire line. Uh, you know, you can see, I can see a, a lot of young, uh, young women and young men that I know uh, in this group here uh, heading out with their saw and their, and their Pulaski's and we have a lot of work to head out and do too. And so uh, I just want to say, I really appreciate the time and opportunity to speak with you all today and uh, be delighted to, to answer any questions. Masi Cho. Well, Dogaden, Shrigadisdin, Ed, as always, um, you can, you know, share so well and um, so, mm -hmm. so on point with um you know whether you're talking about this and uh where we're at on our um global and local decision making or whether you're working on language or whether you're working with young people and youth on education so um you never 
you have such a ability to contribute and so i um thank you very much and uh we do have definitely have time for questions um and maybe we can scroll back i believe that there was um an early question that um i'm trying to find it uh i think it was uh sharina that had an initial question in the um, chat, and the question was, how long have have you been doing burning, and is there funding for this or through the or through the federal or state um, is there federal or state funding that you know of? And then, yeah, just so our cultural burning practices were actually banned, uh, you know, a while ago. And so we're in this new process now of of working with land managers on uh, their different protection uh, zones. Uh, we're trying to increase cooperation internationally on how land is protected and, and what it's designated as. Um, so there's there's that that's happening. Um, but you know we hope to have uh, more cooperation with the Alaska Fire Service with the um, and, and others uh, around the restoration of which and cultural burning practices so that we can uh, increase um, the health of our animals, increase the health of our people, uh, and also decrease the risks of catastrophic wildland fire that we've had to endure so far. The let burn policy, the you know the kind of street vernacular and the let burn policy, the limited protection of uh, lands in Alaska is um, a strategy that uh, is adopted from the kind of failures of Western fire management in a different uh, biome and a different uh, kind of terrain. And we need to have an understanding that Alaska is not Montana. You know, uh, I've fought fire all across the West, and, and I know a num number of you have. I see even some of my students, uh, you know, from who I taught uh, 15, 20 years ago on the chat who used to fight fire themselves, and they fought fire all the way across the West, too. And those they know that fighting fire in the Redwoods is different than than what we have here in Alaska. And, and we can't have the same, po you know, uh, uh, policies around it. So we need to have a uh, better understanding. And I see somebody just shared uh, a link to that uh, possible funding to help do that. And I know that there's some uh, strategies out there uh, for, for making plans and so forth in the United States. Uh, it's very important for us to have this across the circumpolar. Uh, sorry, the audio didn't work for the video. Um, it was just dramatic piano playing. Um, so uh, you know, it, you did, you didn't hear, you didn't miss any audio of uh, somebody speaking or of any kind of narrative around it, it was just the words on the on the thing with kind of uh, uh, piano playing in the background. But it was nice piano playing. But uh, sorry, you missed that part of it. Great. Well, I will, um, John. If you want to, John Pennington, if you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your question that you put here in the um, in the uh, chat to uh, to Ed, that would be great. Oh. Hey everyone. <laughs> it, it actually wasn't a question. It was more just a statement, Melinda, that we have some real challenges uh, with the disaster process. Uh, once, you know, if things do get out of control, uh, it's just stressing that if we look at the FEMA process for, for assisting wildfires, that's pretty straightforward. But if if things get out of control and villages are burned and, and we want to look at a tribal option for declaring a disaster, the, the process just does not work for Alaska tribes after ANCSA and the way that we're designed. Uh, and, and I was just more bringing that to everyone's attention that the consequences of these things um, have some, especially as the wildfire increases, are going to have impacts on our, our really rural and isolated communities. And uh, I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar. Mm -hmm. uh, Edward, uh, amazing presentation. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Ed, did you want to respond to anything that he brought up there? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I do think, uh, John, I mean, what you just mentioned, right, that's, you know, um, Ed started out talking about governance. So, right, so that's like governance at our national level. And we know that there's quite a few barriers, right, with our disaster response and that adaptive management. So how, you know, collectively when we're thinking about working in this space, how do we elevate that? You know, how do we elevate those regulations and those programs um, at the federal level, especially now, 
right? When we have this administration and under Department of Interior or FEMA, you know, they're trying to look at those governance structures and um, and and then you know who's the, who's the messenger? Who can who can carry that? You know, Ed is working at this international level. How do we also look at you know what can we do as tribal nations to address those um, restrictions like what you know what we may run into under um, federal disaster? So. I, 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 guess, really, I guess I will yeah. jump in here and address it. And, you know, <laughs> since we're talking about it, yeah, sure. you know, the the uh, about a week and a half ago, there there was the national um, uh, strategy on on wildland fire came out, and and you know, during in the, in that strategy, there was an estimate. I think four and a half percent of GDP is estimated to combat wildland fires by the uh, mid century, and so if you think about uh, that sum, that's greater than the Department of Defense budget, and so that's losses to uh, America. Uh, annually uh, accruing uh, through di disasters, uh, and then also uh, the cost of our collective response to wildland fire, and so the that sum is uh, you know is almost equal to what was spent uh, you know on the Apollo uh, uh, mission, and and so we really need to have a better understanding about the scale of our our national response, and that has to include funding obviously for uh, tribal government. It has to include uh, inclusion of tribes on uh, the management of our homelands, uh, and it and it also has to include uh, state government and and what the state does too uh, is very important. Right now in Alaska, Alaska is currently uh, standing up a carbon offsets office. Um, that offsets office needs to be inclusive of uh, Yetima management, right? Not just forest management, but it needs to have uh, an active policy on. Uh, offsets for for Yetima uh, and include uh, strategies for the better protection of um, surface disturbance on on those lands. And so we've seen uh, kinds of um, uh, miscues and missteps uh, even on the national level from say Bureau of Land Management on the Ambler Road uh, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, the non-inclusion there of uh, Yetima disturbance, uh, the non- uh, kind of raising of um, uh, issues around increased wildland fire along that road, a uh, potential road, uh, and not including all the climate implications of disturbing Yetima in one of the most highly Yetimized areas in the nation. And so we have to think about these things as national climate resources, and we have to think about our response in that sense. Like we have a we have a responsibility to to manage these uh, resources, uh, but I you know. Uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get there. I'm working with the the state of Alaska right now on in their carbon offset office, uh, in those discussions. Uh, and so, which in uh, Council International doesn't just engage on the international level. We also engage with subnational governments uh, on international issues, uh, and so uh, or national governments uh, when there's an international component. And so, uh, it's very important that our our people are represented at those tables and. And that's what we try to do. But I, I know that there's other people with some questions. And so I uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Thanks, John. All right. I see that. Uh, Sharina, you have a question again? Go ahead. Hey. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharina McKinney. I'm originally from Antioch. I live in McGrath now. Um, I'm Athabaskan Yupik, and I have lived all over the Kuskokwim from Bethel to McGrath. So I know a great part of my river. And um, recently I moved to McGrath and we have a division of forestry base here in McGrath. So it's really cool because it's a part of my community and I just took on this ICAP position and I want to implement air quality in home and outside of McGrath, just because we're a region where we do have active uh, wildland fires a lot. And um, there's just a lot of cool programs and fundings I'm learning as I go, because I literally just started this the last day of October. And my, like, my five-year goal is our tribal members to have good air quality indoors and outdoors so even houseplants but like I was wondering about the cultural burning 
you guys do the springtime and who it's funded from. And if that's something I could implement in my work plan for FY25. And if there's funding, where did you get it? And if I could talk to the um, man or the big boss here when he comes back uh, next season, if it's something we could look into, even if we can't do it next year, I could do it. We could do something the following year, you know, plan it. But this is a lot of cool stuff. And I know McGrath, like 10, 15 years ago, got hit with a big fire right up the road. We have a road that goes like how many miles out? And there's this huge fire and it took out like a lot of the wood and a lot of the berries that we get around here. And now that like it's been so long, McGrath is known for our blueberries because we get a lot of big blueberries. And um, it's really cool because a lot of people get that burned wood from up the road to heat their houses and stuff. But we also get like blueberries, like a lot of blueberries now throughout the year. So a lot of this is a lot of good information. And I'm like, I'm here for it. So if you guys could reach out to me, I'll put my email in the chat and we could connect. But it's really cool getting into this uh, I got program. And I'm so excited. I'm glad I got to meet you all and listen to I'm glad to hear. Glad to hear about it. You know, it's uh, the EPI yeah. gap program is a super important program. And, you know, it's intersection with health is really important. Like the... The stuff that you you might see some some links other folks have posted in the chat uh, for for grant resources and, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done in the in the Yukon Flats is we've uh, uh, worked. We have a contract fire crew. Uh, the Council of Athabascan Tribal Governments owns its own fire crew. Uh, that's an important step. We also compact with uh, the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge on several issues, and so um, including. Uh, on wildlife management and so um you know uh, moose permitting uh, other kinds of th issues um we've compacted mm -hmm. some of those those uh issues and so we're actually the managers of, of some of those things in in the yukon flats and i think that's an important thing for uh, other communities to really engage in as direct compacting with the bureau of indian affairs direct compacting with uh individual agencies uh throughout the government and then filing 102-477 plans, PL 102-477 plans, so that the reporting requirements for your tribe is very manageable. Um, you know, that's a whole nother topic, but um, I would say really embrace um, your sovereignty. Remember that your community is a sovereign government, obviously, and we all need to kind of really engage in, in uh, the work of our sovereign governments and understand like the history there. Uh, and teach that history to our children uh, and understand where, where each of us is from and really uh, really work towards that end. On the health side of things, uh, there's uh, One Health Program, the Center for One Health Research at UAF. Um, you know, they're um, very interested in the intersection of uh, animal, uh, ecological health, uh, human health. And so when you talk about your, your, your um, indoor air quality, uh, that's something that you know obviously very important to, to everyone and so um you know the intersection with wildland fire uh and and uh, disease and the animals and disease and humans is something that which in council international talks a lot about as well um and so <clears throat> you know you think about inflammatory diseases in general uh there's a big intersection with the inflammation we see in the forest and so uh heart disease diabetes um a whole range of other kinds of um, uh, issues that are that come up with uh, wildland fire, and so uh, very important to uh, to examine that. And so we're grateful for the research that's taken place at the One Health uh, Center for One Health Research. Also, thanks for your question. Great. Well, that is um. There's you know you're such a great source of information, and I and a lot of people on this webinar. Um, on this session, this information session, definitely um, we're sharing some of those uh, resources in the chat. So I'd encourage you definitely to um, 
hopefully copy those down or copy your chat. Some of them we listed in additional slides with visuals. Um, a couple of these have been out for a little uh, a little while now, but they're still very much relevant and have great information that also can be cited when you are looking for additional funding. Um, the Alaska changing um, wildfire environment, of course, has got a lot of graphic. Um, it's a graphic publication along with uh, the Yukon Flats, which I recently um, revisited, and it's just, um, you know, quite a bit of information. The Yukon Flats is um, inclusive of, of course, uh, local uh, views and perspectives and indigenous knowledge, and um, and the Alaska Fire Science Consortium is also a great resource. These are links if you come on to, um, if you download this um, presentation. And uh, next slide. And then again, um, Ed shared some of these and so did um, Devlin um, and then Allison as well. Um, you know, the there's uh, great um, information on the um, Arctic Council's uh, webpage that, um, that Ed mentioned and then a forthcoming webinar by ACAP, which again, will have additional information. And um, and I just want to touch on uh, just one or make one or two more points, you know, again, um, sort of uh, thinking about, you know, these compounding effects and, you know, the, the immensity of this that Ed talked about. And then the fact that, you know, how do we work on, a, on, on multiple scales, you know, from local to all the way up to Arctic Council and global scale. Um, and, and I listening to Ed had me think of two things, right? Um, our traditional chief, um, Trimble Gilbert, um, has shared in in many forms, you know, about and and maybe we can end end this end this session with Ed if he knows about um, this, because I'm sure with his language work he might have a little bit of background. Um, where Trimble talks about our relationship with a with fire and the you know and the fire keeper and somebody who had to travel with the fire and in, in the cold but before you do that ed and we'll close right after that um is another thought to think about with the increased vegetation that we're seeing you know with um vegetation growing going north and um and what that might mean for fires down the road. You know, we have multiple programs as as indigenous um, communities with our young people or brush clearing. And, um, you know, how do we, how do we definitely um, combine, you know, some of our current resources that we have if we've missed some of the funding deadlines to really think about, um, you know, what needs to be cleared out and what needs to be maintained and what can we do um, with the resources we have as we're also trying to build our own capacity and awareness and access funding out there. So I just um, share, wanted to share that. So Ed, I'll turn it over to you for any final comments. Yeah, I mean, you you know, the uh, when we think about uh, wildland fire, I, I think the, um, like culturally from a perspective, um, people, um, you know, uh, one of the reasons we selected this issue is not just because of, of the huge devastating impact it had on our, our region and so forth. Uh, obviously, we could have talked about food security, the collapse of the Yukon River salmon, uh, the the collapse of the ecosystem as a whole, like in, the, in what we're seeing in, in general. Uh, one of the reasons that we, we talked about wildland fire as the first thing, or one of the reasons that we we uh, restored which and river names first was because we have a different um, uh, we have a different way of um, finding our directions in Guichen. Okay, so in uh, in English and uh, in the in the Western world, we have north, south, east, and west. North, south, east, and west doesn't mean anything when you're north of the Arctic Circle and the sun's coming up in a different spot every day, and so we don't have the north, south, east, west directional system. We have two directional systems in Guichen. One is based around our rivers. And so we say upriver, downriver, up and away from the river. We say yeah, di, yeah, ni, you know, and oak. And we say everything is in relation to the river. And so our relationship is to the river. Uh, and that's how we determine uh, where we at, we're at and where we're going. 
And so when we talked about our places, we said we need to start with our river names first because that's how we determine uh, where we are and where we're going as a people, okay? And then we said, well, we have uh, this these issues. There's a bunch of them that we have to deal with and nobody can agree. And geopolitically, uh, the United States and Russia and other countries, they're all in dispute right now and we're having a hard time finding direction. And we said, well, as good people, we find our direction through fire too. And the other directional system is based around fire. And so everything's about our relationship to fire, towards the fire, away from the fire. And that's how we'd even talk about uh, our traditional uh, 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 dwelling is a synonym. It has, it has the same, it's a homonym. It has the same meaning as fire and also home. And so mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about our, our relationship to the land, we talk about our relationship to where we're going and how we find our direction. Fire becomes uh, really central to that. And so we thought it's important to us to think about it like that. And if, if our intention is there and our leadership is thinking about it like this, then perhaps we can sit to a common fire, right? We can actually have uh, keep Arctic governance going, keep discussions going and, and see uh, wildland fire, not just as something that uh, we, we address, but uh, we we use fire itself as something that we gather around, that we use fire itself as something that we talk about and find our direction, our collective direction with, right? And so that's why the chairship initiative is important, right? Is because it reflects that intentionality. It reflects our, our mentality that we can find our direction together uh, with fire. And so even during uh, some of our fire-related events, like when we had the Arctic... Uh, wildland fire sharing circle uh, I kept the fire going during that whole meeting and so and I would tell people you know we're going to keep this fire going for the whole time that we gather here and so that we're united around this topic you see and uh, that's our tradition that we have a have a fire and so uh, when we uh, Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council many many years ago there was only like a 15 members or something we had a meeting in Fort Yukon and we started a fire and I got a bunch of young men together and I said, you group are going to stay around this fire and you're going to keep this fire going. Uh, no matter what, 24 seven, I want this fire going. It's important to us that in our tradition that uh, we stay united like this fire and that we bring every, everybody bring something together so that we can uh, work together on this. And after that meeting, we had 55 signatories to that body. And so, uh, and that's because the intention of our direction is inclusive and it's bringing people together around one single thing. And so that's how uh, we've tried to approach it culturally as well. Not just in, not just in uh, uh, submitting projects to the Arctic Council, okay? Like that, that's not, uh, that's not how things actually get done in real life. We actually have to think about it and have uh, a deeper, <laughs> deeper understanding of, of, uh, why we want something to occur and how it should occur. Mm. Well, Hazjur Gadis, then thank you all. And thank you, especially to you, Ed, for um, sharing on so many different levels, you know, from multiple, multiple perspe perspectives. And um, may we all be intentional in, in keeping this discussion going and taking action. So uh, thank you all and um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Dogaden.